I call the November 26, 2018 work session meeting of the Portsmouth City Council to order. And Madam Clark, will you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Clark? Here. Mrs. Lucas Burke? Here. Mr. Moody? Here. Ms. Simmons? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Mayor Rowe? Here. And tonight we have a joint meeting with the Planning Commission that uh, was postponed because of the hurricane. And uh, I understand that, Amy, you'll chair tonight's meeting. Yes. Will you call your meeting to order, please? I would like to call the uh, joint session with the Planning Commissioners and City Council to order. Madam Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I call world, we use our state, our state present. Commissioner Williams. <coughs> Thompson. Present. Commissioner Youngblood. Present. Commissioner G. Present. Commissioner Thaxton. Present. Commissioner Rick. Present. Five members of the Planning Commission are present. We have a quorum. <laughs> and first, thank you me. for agreeing to meet with us, and I hope that everybody had a grand Thanksgiving. Thank you. Good. And this is the holiday season, so I know that this is uh, taking on uh, time from your own personal schedule. And on behalf of council, we thank you for being here tonight, but most importantly, thank you for, for serving our community. And with that, Dr. Patton. Yes, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of City Council, during tonight's public work session, Planning Director Bob Baldwin and Planning Administrator Mr. John Hartley will lead a discussion of two important elements of the Zoning Ordinance Rewrite Project. Number one, zoning philosophy, <coughs> and number two, the zoning use table. As you will recall, these items were originally scheduled for the joint work session during the September 27, 2018, but was ultimately canceled due to Hurricane Florence. To assist in tonight's work session, you have two handouts including a description of some of the philosophies contained in the current zoning ordinance of 2010, as well as a copy of the zoning use table. These materials are the same that were provided to you in September and in your in the box on your iPads are all of this information. Mr. Baldwin. Good evening, Mayor Rowe, Vice Mayor Simmons, members of City Council, uh, Vice Chair Thompson, and members of the Planning Commission, and good evening. And, i um, certainly glad to be um, taking part in this conversation. Um, again, as been noted, this was as a, a rescheduling from back in September. Um, these are two items that the uh, City Council had indicated they wanted to spend more time discussing as part of the zoning ordinance project. And before I get too deep in that, I do want to make two quick introductions uh, just for your information. I, um, over here on my right is Melissa Simpson with uh, the consulting firm of WSP, and they are now assisting us in the, uh, in the rewrite project. And on the other side of the room, uh, we have Julie Chop, our new planner. And uh, would you stand up, please? <laughs> Both of you, so. <laughs> so thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, Julie is in note-taking mode here tonight. Um, so we're going to jump right in here. Um, and as, as we indicated, this uh, really originated, originated from City Council wanting to discuss both the philosophy of the zoning ordinance as well as some discussions on the use table. And just for a little general background, I think most of you recognize the primary purpose of a zoning ordinance is to regulate land use and uh, as the state code would describe providing for the orderly development of land. That's the general uh, enabling legislation language. But, you know, buried within zoning ordinances, and this applies to all zoning ordinances, not just ours, there are certain philosophies that each community applies in their zoning ordinances. They craft a zoning ordinance to accomplish what they want. This can be uh, recommendations out of a conference of plan or other community standards they want uh, recognized through the zoning ordinance. And that's one reason when you go community to community, even when a re within a region like Hampton Roads, you can find wide variety in zoning ordinances and zoning regulations as each community tries to craft uh, the type of re land use regulations they think are most appropriate for them. So that's really, uh, in this case, trying to get to what are the community standards or city council is the, is the spokes people, so to speak, for the community in this regard, since the zoning ordinance is a legislative act of council when you adopt it. So we're attempting to get to the uh, community standard when we do this. Um, and when we go back to um, 2010, and we'll go back to the process a little bit before 2010, um, there were certain philosophies that are 
uh, what I would call embedded uh, or incorporated within the zoning ordinance. Now, to most people, casual users, you may not be aware. It just looks like a set of regulations. But when you get kind of down deep into it, you see there were specific uh, goals and objectives that the city was attempting to accomplish through the zoning regulations. And some of the more common ones, we've attempted to extract these out, thinking this might be helpful as you get into the conversation. We'll just walk through a few of these. Because you may, because I want to talk about two different aspects. One is the philosophy. And then the next one is how the zoning ordinance executes that through regulation. And just sort of put that in the back of your mind for a future, future conversation. We'll talk about being developer friendly. And the uh, process that led up to the 2010 ordinance, one of the goals was try to create an ordinance that was developer friendly. It wanted to have more buy right uses and fewer use permits. And I think for those of us who had worked with the prior ordinance compared to this one, that's certainly uh, been accomplished. It wanted to have more mixed uses. There was a philosophy of mixing uses being better, provides more opportunity for developers. So there was a, uh, a specific intent to create more mixed use district. Um, the, one of the philosophies that was embedded in the zoning ordinance that developers preferred it if you just let them know what the rules are. And that would help them to comply. And so we have more defined what we call prescriptive standards, mandatory regulatory requirements that are built into the zoning code. The, the spoken intent at the time was to try to, t to make sure developers knew exactly what the city was looking for and would use those prescriptive standards to serve as an alternate, having people go through use permits for sort of case-by-case -case, uh, conditions being applied. Uh, and Type 2 site plan, I think you've heard me mention this enough times, we've abandoned the use of the Type 2 site plan since that was a process that was handled through the Planning Commission and determined that the Planning Commission does not have authority to modify zoning standards as the, the uh, 2010 ordinance was um, was doing through the Type 2 site plan. So that process has been abandoned. There was a philosophy of raising the bar on development. This came straight out of the 2005 Comprehensive Plan, Destination 2025, where there was a community desire to raise quality just across the board citywide. And how was that done? Again, it was done through prescriptive standards. Uh, additional development standards that weren't in place in 2000, prior to 2010. And there's another section of the code, again, we'll get to in a future meeting when we talk about nonconformities, a section there on nonconforming site aspects that we'll want to spend some time discussing. Uh, design versus use space. I think this is one of those things that council's been uh, most uh, vocal in, in opposition to. This is our form-based code districts, the D2, and in, in uh, most cases the D1, where you've got design base, in other words, the code was describing what it wants buildings to look like, what it wants uses to look like, with the theory being that if you design it the right way, the uses will follow. So it's much less of a, a um, an ordinance based on, <coughs> on uses, more based on design parameters. Uh, it was also a different kind, as you recall, designed by street frontage, not a parcel by parcel. The street frontage says the buildings ought to look like this, and that became the zoning. And within the D1, of course, we have what we call the smart code. That's the transects, and you see that described as those T districts. Um, when we bring things forward in the, in the downtown, you see the T1, and actually the T3, uh, 4, 5, and 6 is what we actually have there, with 6 being most intensive. The other thing the code wanted to be, wanted to be much more bike and pedestrian friendly. And so that was done through by uh, adding parking maximums. Uh, those have since been revised, and when we redid the parking standards, and those were removed. Uh, had uh, shared parking requirements. It had extensive parking and screening requirements, try to hide cars and make them less uh, visible in the environment. Um, it established for the first time minimum bike standards for, for parking bicycles in different uses. It has requirements for linking uses to the sidewalks and pedestrian ways. And the, probably the biggest thing people are aware of in the downtown in the D1 area, no parking requirements. So the uses downtown have no minimum parking requirements. And that came about from that. So to me, as we talk about philosophy, just want to give you something to get kind of thinking about a little bit. But that was sort of some of the basic philosophies. I think there's an overriding one we're all recognizing the, the code intended to be much more urban and less suburban, more density. Um, and that got kind of built in through those same things. But that was sort of the philosophical underpinnings that developed the 2010 ordinance. And so when you look at that, you can look at what's your philosophy, what are you trying to accomplish. And then the next thing we'll you know, have to obviously do is, is create the regulatory environment to create that. Um, and so we can certainly talk, if you have any questions about that tonight, about you know, how things uh, work today. Uh, but with that, um, Mr. Mayor, I'll turn the conversation back over to you and see you know, if council has any specific uh, philosophical or planning commission as well, any philosophical uh, points you want us to take a look at. 
I would just mention we're in the reconstruction part of the zoning ordinance now. We've, we've kind of deconstructed what was wrong with before as we start to move forward. It's really critical to get council to advise what is it you want these regulations to accomplish and what's going to be your, your uh, zoning philosophy as we move forward. Before we get into the philosophy of the 2010, are there any questions from what Bob has presented on this slide? Okay. Okay. Um, I was just wondering when a citizen or a developer uh, goes in to fill out an application or a permit, um, is there an excerpt from the zoning code that um, is applicable to their little section, you know, so they wouldn't need the whole zoning code, but if they're doing something specific to one area, is there like an excerpt in the <laughs> permit somewhere so that they will be drawn into what is required. Un unfortunately, the this current zoning ordinance is all interconnected with other pieces, so there really isn't one. I mean, there's certain, certainly a place where you can find out what, whether the use is allowed by right or not allowed or needs a use permit. And we can certainly look up standards that would apply, but there's a whole number of issues that can come up depending on your location. Are you in a flood zone? Are you in a Chesapeake Bay area? Are you in a historic district? Um, so there really isn't one place to go to get some simple under the current code. Now the current code is very intricate. You know, there's a lot of uh, in interrelated pieces, one section of the ordinance to another. So uh, generally, it, it's uh, much more involved to try to get to the to the answer, depending on the question. Now sometimes these are relatively simple, but sometimes they can be rel relatively complicated. The follow-up on her question: How many separate documents make up the zoning ordinance? Right. Well, what we would, you know, what we typically would call the zoning ordinance itself, is contained in three major, three major documents. Um, one of them we've been slowly uh, dismantling the D2 district. As you know, we've been working on the parking. We've been ro rolling the D2 standards into the city, the primary zoning ordinance. So we've been slowly deconstructing the, the D2 um, form-based code piece. The the D1 standards, for example, they are they are contained within a larger plan document. You have to go find those. That's much more convoluted, I have to tell you, for people to have to go and search for that within a plan document. It's not what I would call, it's not, it's not illegal zoning practice. I just find it to be not the best zoning practice for that. Short answer to Lisa's question is that no. No, yeah, I think that's. But I think that would probably be helpful to some developers or citizens when they, they're going in and they, you know, say they're gonna, you know, put some new windows in in a historic district. Then, mm -hmm. you know, that particular part of the code that would apply to their permit or their application, if it could be like an insert or a highlight or the arrow drawn to it or something, mm -hmm. you know, so that they don't have to, you know, search the whole zoning ordinance to find where they need to be compliant. Yeah, and we're and we've taken from some of our previous work sessions that one you're looking for is as a simplified more streamlined ordinance. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of along the lines of what you're describing there. It's a little bit more detail, and more user uh, but more user friendly. Right. All right, Bill, okay. ask for the floor. Bill. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, when do you anticipate the reconstruction of the D2 to the form-based code uh, redo being completed? Well, uh, well, the D2 piece, you may recall, we came back to council a few months ago and showed you a, a concept of, right. of what the uses would look like. Right. We're now working on the overlay district that would sit on top of that, that's underway. So I'd say probably, you know, within 60 to 90 days. That would be done. Um, now we need to go back out and meet with the community uh, that we met with during the plan process we did with MDC. We went out and did the land use plan that we based the zoning off of and, and check back in with the, you know, the business owners and the community out there. But we should be able to put together that because we're now basing, we're linking it back to the standard zoning pieces. What we have to do now is, is be able to go through and sort of uh, within the, you know, the D2 district's a very large land area with a lot of different kind of land uses. So we'll need to go in there and, and carve out some specifics and then we're working on that now. If a developer comes to uh, planning tomorrow morning, uh, since some of these pieces are in the uh, reconstruction stage, mm -hmm. to use your word, uh, what, uh, what, what, what do we give them, what do we tell them about uh, about the, the zoning that they need or the permits that they need. Are, are we basing that on current or what is what will be in the next 60 to 90 right, days? It depends, it depends on what they're asking. You know, if they want to do something simple or something that's relatively you know, provable under the current code, which a number of things have been, we'll just say you know, you're within the D2 zone, you're allowed to do these things. 
especially if they're within an existing building or an existing site. If it's something different, if it needs a rezoning, if the use needs a rezoning, um, we're telling them to rezone it based on what we showed city council um, a few months ago to follow the, the proposed new D2 district. And we would advise them that that's, that would be the direction we would recommend they to go to use that. And they could come in and, and request a rezoning based off of that. Off the new off the, zoning. Exactly, off of what would be the new zoning. Okay, thanks. And Amy's asked for the floor, and please, this is a joint meeting, so uh, let me know if you want the floor, yeah, Amy. Um, I think, my first I have a comment. Um, initially, I look at developer friendly and then more prescriptive and to me, that is really dictating what they can or cannot do. So my initial thought was that that seemed a little contradictory. And then to your point, I, I agree with what you're saying. I mean, if, if we want people to come in, and I assume this extends into redevelopment, mm -hmm. and especially in our historic neighborhoods, there's, um, I've heard discussions about, you know, in particular historic guidelines being um, a detriment to people wanting to come in and do it. So I, I just think that if we're talking about the philosophy and we're trying to be more developer friendly and we want our neighborhoods to be revitalized, then that's something that we should consider at this point. Other comments? Elizabeth. I, I think all of us would look at this 2010 philosophies, you know, and today we still want to be developer friendly and raise the bar on quality and be bike and pedestrian friendly in the downtown area, um, design base versus use base is sort of your bailiwick. Um, but but realizing that like the bike and pedestrian stuff was where we got into so much crazy trouble with like the apartment buildings all of a sudden were required to have a hundred bicycle parking. I mean, some crazy number of bicycle because it which didn't make sense. Nobody in their right mind would park all those bicycles outside. Um, and that's where we really got into trouble, um, to me. Right. And de developer friendly to me, um, and my past experience, means that the city is not going to hit them first with no. That they'll say, well, let, let's talk about it. Let's try to work through it. Let's uh, look at what we can do rather than just turn them away and say no. Um, that's what developer friendly means to me because I, in the past I've seen, uh, been, been involved with the historic commission in my previous tenure. Um, there were some real hard line folks that would come in and say, oh no, no, you aren't going to do that. You know, I mean, they were like judge, jury, and all when they, they needed to, you know, find out more of what developers capability was and what, what he could do and could not do or wanted to. And and it's just not a flat no. It's just, okay, this well, let's, how can we work through like this? Uh, how can we make it happen? That's what, they want to That's what it means to me. Yeah. I think, uh, and again, I'm speaking for me, not for anybody else. I think these are lofty goals, but they failed. It, it was not developer friendly yeah. uh, when uh, Wendy's could not uh, yeah. develop when a storage building and a, couldn't uh, be developed when I say storage building you know mm -hmm. a storage rental place mm -hmm. because of its height that's not too developer friendly and I agree with Ray it, we need to have a let's work to yes certainly we all want quality development <clears throat> um, the bike thing is is interesting um, it's almost, are you kidding? Yeah. You know, I gotta have bike that, racks at a grocery store. You know, that was applied to the uh, Kroger's. Uh, Kroger's. Yeah. And, and they they develop all across the nation, and they had never heard of such a thing. There have been more, almost more bicycles than, than automobiles in the parking lot. It's hard enough to get your groceries to the car. Yeah, 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 yeah. Try to get them home on a bike. I don't see many people carrying yeah. their groceries away on a bicycle. And then, does that, I think design base kind of shot us in the foot on that one. Versus use base. And, and I mentioned that because as we move past, you know, the, the use and we get into more 
of the reconstruction of the ordinance will start getting into your regulatory standards. That's the execution piece. And I think <clears throat> what you're, I hear you describe is that the intent to be developer friendly was there. The way the code went about doing it was a miss. And we point out a number of things uh, which we've discussed with council and the planning commission before, some of the distance separation requirements, for example, that are that built into that ordinance. We've had a number of people that have had to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals to get variances for a, a number of uses all over town. Something just wasn't well thought through as, as an example. So I use that as an example, but what I'm hearing is you want to make sure that, again, just to answer the question well, what the intent was, you know, the intent was if I tell the developers the rules, they'll be happy with that. And it depends on what the rules are. Right, and I think that's what you saw happen. And we here. need to do a good scrub too to make sure that what's on page 53 is not contradicted on 78. And that we have a way to, uh, and I remember with the bike racks and the, the street furniture, there was no avenue for uh, a variance, mm -hmm. whatever. You couldn't go to city council, you couldn't go to court. It was like there was just no. The end and go away. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. The question I have, and I, I think this is a short eight years, and you look at the economy and the changes that uh, the city and the, the country as a whole has gone through in that time period. What can we do to, and I, I don't know if variance is the right um, avenue, but what can we do to allow more flexibility and nimbleness of, uh, of changes so that it's easier on the planning department as well to adjust for design style changes and requirements of the generations that, because if we look eight years from now, the individuals who would be looking to move into Portsmouth and develop in Portsmouth are in their teens and the early 20s. So what can we do to make it easier for you all as well to, to make those changes? Uh, a <clears throat> couple things uh, come to my mind. Uh, number one is be careful about how prescriptive your standards are. Um, we, as, a, as an example, we have a prescriptive standard for 40% glazing of windows, and then we run into a Wawa store that uh, it's in the Walmart parking lot, and it's a requirement to have windows on the inside where they'd have a cooler because they were facing a street. That was a mandate <coughs> in the design standard. So. That just, again, some of those just aren't well thought of. But I think the, one of the issues you're getting to, and we've discussed this before, is, is, is uh, we've created it. It's in with the parking and it's into the signs, but using a special exception process, which would be a single trip to the Board of Zoning Appeals, not for a variance, but for, a spe for an exception, a modification. And that's a, probably a much better way to handle sort of basic design issues that don't rise to the level of city council needing to get involved with the use itself, but might want somebody to have some ability to adjust the windows or just Use the doors or those type of things. Bill's house for, for the floor. You, you know, that trip to the Board of Zoning Appeals, uh, it, are we still charging 300 and some odd dollars? Uh, that was that? quoted to me today, three, uh, 350. 350. You know, I, <coughs> that's set I'm wrong. I thought many we had years a conversation ago. about that. That if, uh, it, you know, we, we're talking about pro business. Uh, you, you know, for me, if I want to request a zoning uh, variance, go to a board. It, even before I go, I got to buy a ticket for three hundred fifty dollars. Yeah. That's that to me. That's not citizen or business friendly. Right. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pat. And uh, to speak to his point. Yes. To, and, and today that amount that um, uh, that fee was quoted to me, which I thought was quite much and it's more than it impacts citizens it may not be a business but you know we have a citizen who wants to come before and I said my comment was a citizen may not have three hundred fifty dollars the issue that they would like to have considered a righted uh, is very important to them but if they don't have the money at that amount then they can't come so when we say well citizens don't come we've told them this is their next step then it may be as i said today because they don't have the money to come forward so this is something been in place that fee and in my tenure it's not been discussed or revisited well i think we need to change it well along those lines is the fee set in the zoning ordinance or in the budget ordinance it's in the budget ordinance. it's in the budget ordinance. all right and, and i'll just mention the one the one um reason that a lot of those fees get in there is we do have a mandatory legal advertising requirement. There's one of the, the um, 
uh, requirements localities are generally made when the General Assembly describes what you're allowed to charge. That, of course, is also covered by the state code, is recouping direct costs. So if we have to pay the Virginia pilot $400 for Average. an ad, we've had that before, a legal ad costing three, four, five hundred dollars $500. Uh, that's a lot of what that application fee is really not paying for the trip or paying for staff. It's usually been covering what I would call direct costs for those types of things. Let's, let's do this. Uh, I think there's sufficient concern that we, we should ask the city manager to look at the pros and cons okay. of lowering the fee and bring that back uh, to both the city council and to the planning commission. How about that? Okay. Are there other accepted ways to advertise that? Uh, it's required. Well, every, every year there's a someone goes to the General Assembly asking for some relief and they always tell them no. Oh. There's been a we we and we recognize a lot a lot fewer people taking the newspaper reading the newspaper, mm -hmm. um, and we've tried to to move away from that. And the General Assembly, I don't know whether it's for whatever their their reasons are, but they've typically held pretty firm that you must lit, you know advertise in a newspaper of local circulation. We have moved ours out of the legal ad. That's where they used to be back before 2013 or so. They were in the legal ads. It was much more expensive to advertise in the legal ads. It doesn't require you to put it in a legal ad. It just has to be in a newspaper. Of, so we've saved a fair amount of money over the years by moving it out of the That's legal ads. That's a very ads. good point because the General Assembly starts in January. Um, is there a consensus to ask the city manager to frame up a letter that um, council can endorse to our General Assembly delegation asking them to change the state code to allow for alternate means of advertising. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you okay. bring that? Back? Yes. And maybe as early as tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, it's, it's no, I'm not. I, I, I hear you. You want me to bring? You want uh, to the letter to be ready by tomorrow, well, or yes, some something background? That the council can endorse okay. that it can. We can have something by tomorrow. On behalf of council. Yes. Asking our general assembly delegation to either put in the legislation or support the well, legislation. Ultimate. Okay. All right. We can have it tomorrow. How many times that, a year do we collect on those fees? About how many? Is it every how month? Much? Two or three times yeah. a month? Yeah. I mean, you, you see the applications. We'll, we'll go back to the re rezonings, use permits. They all have fees. Board of Zoning Appeals has its own fees for variances but have for special exceptions. It's very light. It's just a, a handful. You know, varies, but you know, one or two a month, maybe, on average. Did the 2010 ordinance really have more by right uses than its predecessor? Yes, it did. Yes, it used to be a lot more use permit applications. I can tell you from personal experience, the city council used to get four, five, six use permits a meeting uh, prior to the 2010 ordinance. When at least back to the time frame I was working before the recession. Um, it definitely has cut down. It's definitely a smaller. Now, since then you've gone back, and we'll talk about that in a second, you've added some back in. But um, yes, there definitely has fewer use permit requirements than used to be, and this, replaced by prescriptive standards. This may be drilling down too quickly to the details, but I think one of the philosophical discussions we need to have is whether or not multifamily um, development should be a by right mm -hmm. use or a conditional use permit. So, it, next slide. Before we let leave that <laughs> slide, thank you for participating. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussions about the overarching philosophies in the 2010? I have a, a yes, comment, Mayor. Uh, in looking at the, tw the document you have in front of you, I think we have um, consensus from Council and um, the um, Planning Commission that the philosophy, developer friendly, raise the bar, all of those um, philosophical are good and still, you still want that specific. Three out of four. Mm -hmm. Three out of four. The design base. Design base versus use yeah. use base. All right, three out of four. Over the executions, we are not agreeing with the executions. Yeah. We'll There work on that as we Therefore, do. the planning department needs to come back with different executions for what you are seeing, the three philosophies you want to move forward on. And, and I'll just add, to. Dr. Ben, the, the simplification philosophy. Right, yes. yeah. The streamlined okay. and simplification philosophy. Okay, we're good. So moving forward to your, 
I'm sorry. I just I just wanted to add add one perspective that that we have in staff we and all of you do also deal with the, the citizens the neighborhoods and uh, when you start talking about this this use permit versus non use permit or permitted by right uh, I, I always have to keep in mind that tension between uh, protecting existing neighborhoods from major changes and and I think all of you have seen some of that in in the last couple of years and the permits that you've had before you and and uh, being quote developer friendly I mean it's it's really there, there's a tension between there can be a tension between those two mm -hmm. and something that you ought to keep in mind not just being totally developer friendly but also uh, treating neighborhoods with respect and and protecting uh, those things that are that make Portsmouth special at the neighborhood level. So, um, just to throw that out on the Thank table. You. Well, I, th I think some of the changes council did on the uh, infill uh, lot size uh, addressed that very thing. That uh, we realized that the communities. Uh, were, were changing due to some of the larger lot sizes that were around in the 40s and the 50s and even the 60s. And people, the product that they were putting on those lots uh, did not conform with the architecture of the, of the communities. Well, and that's why what we're doing is so important and it needs to be as good as we can make it. So we got the balance. No. Now let's tell there's no perfect. You know, there's just we just can't shoot for perfect. We try to balance the, the community, the community interests. Um, back to the issue, we as we move toward the talk about the use table, we thought you might be interested in just sort of focusing a little bit on what you typically see under our uh, use permit applications that make it to city council. And we, while well, you might have an, a you know a, a one-off use permit for for something. These are, these are the core of the use permits that come to city council on a regular basis. And I think you're familiar with all of them. Number one, we have the multifamily. That's, that was one that was not in the 2010 ordinance, was put back in, it, it preceded the 2010 ordinance. The use permit requirement was taken out in 2010. City council put it back in 2015. So that's the multifamily. We have a number of, of uh, you know, drive-through use permit requirements. And, you know, oddly enough, for example, you could build a, you know, 50,000 square foot store by right, put a drive-through window for a pharmacy, and it triggers a use permit. Um, so we have a number of those. We always like to say if we could have a standard for Chick-fil-A and something for everybody else, it would probably be a lot easier because they really push the envelope on drive-throughs. Um, entertainment establishments, we've seen, uh, obviously, downtown a number of issues come up with entertainment establishments, whether it was uh, the mansion, the recent uh, Greyhound, Perot's Greyhound Club. Those are all under our entertainment establishment definition. Convenience store with the gas pumps, you know, that's the Wawa's, the 7-Elevens. Um, convenience stores permitted by right, gas pumps permitted by right, put the two together, you need a use permit. Um, and then the last one, of course, we see the telecommunication towers. These are the, the larger towers, not the, um, the ones that are rolling out under this uh, um, 5G system. So those are the common ones. I don't know if you wanted to start some conversation about you know, how, where you are with those. Are, those are clearly the ones that I think as Mr. Hart was noting, notice, noting you can have some differences of opinion um, how you want to go. Um, and obviously you don't need to decide tonight. We're going to be coming back to you with staff, some staff input on the rest of the use table as we go, you know, go along. But these are the ones we think council, since you see these all the time, would, might be most interested in weighing in on initially. At the risk of sinking the ship, uh, <laughs> maybe we pick the easiest first, which would be drive-through windows, in my mind. Yeah. Do you need to? How do you all feel about that? I mean, it makes no sense to me that you have to have a use permit on a 100,000-square-foot building like Kroger mm -hmm. for their drive-through. That, that doesn't yeah. make sense. No, it doesn't. In a fast food restaurant, I mean, that's they got, <laughs> they've got to have a drive-through. That's what is. That's why it's fast food. Right. There's no need to have a use permit for a drive-through no. window. It doesn't matter what the purpose is. They're just if it's going to meet all the other requirements. Mm -hmm. 
it, and that really we go back to our execution piece, yeah. having a design standard for how a drive-through doesn't block traffic in the street. Mm -hmm. And I always use use my favorite example. It's the the Hardy is up at um, yes, that's Tire Neck Road. What does it take everybody to go straight out into the street? Yeah. And that's what you're trying to avoid. That's why you have use permits. That's mm -hmm. those kind of old. No, those are you know old buildings converted. The newer newer. Uh, Fast food, right? They have this down. This is their business, and we generally don't have that kind of an issue. But that gives you an example of where the idea um, uh, came for that type of a, of a drive-through. But certainly, that was a Sunoco station. <laughs> so, well, so that's something that they have every day. Would be picked up if they did design it. Uh, not taking good things into consideration, that would be picked up in the site plan review. Right, and we already have standards. We'll, you know, we'll go through that later in a future discussion as we go through the execution pieces. Uh, we already have standards in there for stacking, not block, not running over people and coming out of a doorway, some of those kind of safety standards that are built in that are use permit or no use permit are going to get applied. For example, um, the Wells Fargo branch that closed on High Street in Churchland, if another bank that's not in ports but wanted to come there now, because mm. there was a break, they would have to have a conditional use. Right, permit. The break was longer than two years. They need a use permit to reestablish the drive-through. Well, is there unanimity on this issue that we're opposed to the new ordinance having a conditional use permit requirement for drive-through windows? Yes. 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 Anybody got heartburn about that? Okay. All right, so there will be no conditional use permit needed for a drive-through. Um, convenience stores with gas pumps. Want to take that one next? Yeah, That's kind of silly. rationale on that. That they're separate, they're okay together. Yeah, well, I think you know that's an evolving land use. Um, I know my staff hears me talk about it all the time. Like, we'll take a Wawa for example. You know that. Or compare that to a 7-Eleven from 20 years ago, where the primary use was, you know, going in there and getting a Slurpee. Now you've got a restaurant inside, and like, what is that? You know, when we look at what does a Royal Farms look like? You go in there, and they've got fried chicken, and they're making sandwiches. And yes, the use has really evolved. The original concept was, you know, if you if you took a auto-intensive use, like people driving in to get gas, mix that with people driving in to go to the convenience store, you're creating traffic problems. And so the use permit would be to evaluate whether or not you're concerned with, but, uh, but quite frankly, with the rare exception of like the uh, 7-Eleven on Greenwood Drive that was built a couple of years ago, you just don't see them separate anymore. You know, you're not going to see anybody just build a service station like it's 1950. Yeah. No. And you're just not going to get a convenience store like 7-Eleven no. when I grew up and no. they didn't have gas pumps. You know, they, Footprints are much larger now, too. They're large, they're different, they're laid out different. Right. We have to accommodate trucks differently, yeah. but again, those are site plan, I consider those really site plan type issues, not is the use okay? The use, if you, you know, it's a commercial retail type of use. If you're comfortable with no use permit, we do. then we'll talk to you about what kind of standard you'd want to apply uh, on development. They can be either minor, or you can be hyper restrictive. You know, that's uh, you get into that community standard. Again, it doesn't rise to the occasion of needing a use permit. No. All right. Well, let's do a quick poll. Is there unanimity <laughs> on not having a conditional use permit for the next to last bullet? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. The next and the last. I mean, let's go to towers and then we'll save. <laughs> <laughs> the next and the last are the entertainment and the convenience stores? Or no, the no, just the convenience yeah. and gas pumps. Just the okay. convenience stores. Convenience stores. Gas convenience stores. Let's okay. go to towers next. Okay. Who wants to weigh in? I think they need to come for public conversation so. to yes. keep the neighborhoods yes. involved. I agree. They, they are our most passionate yes. items. Yes. yes. Okay, so yes. that stays. Mm -hmm. Everybody in agreement? Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and 10 years from now, when those 18 year olds come along and the towers have changed, they can modify the <laughs> zoning ordinance. Well, and with 5G rolling out, I mean, as was stated earlier, it won't be as much of an issue. So. Yeah. All right, entertainment establishments. I don't think we have a, a, a good description of what they are anymore. It's like, you know, the tiny little coffee shop on High Street could have a guy playing the guitar 
with a microphone and all of a sudden it's something different. Mm -hmm. And there's no alcohol <clears throat> or anything like that. It's all about the music. Right. And so, uh, um, Can you come if John, you have, yeah, let's, you have let's, the definition of entertainment oh, establishment. Over there to the podium. Mm -hmm. you can, you get Can you get through? Can you get through? I'm sorry. Oh, these wires. Okay. And the chair's not well, moving. And while That's we my wait for the logistics of travel, <laughs> the definition. Let's put it's got a good it's a point. I mean, do we really <laughs> want to require conditional use permit for a acoustic guitar playing in a coffee shop? Well, the Hardys on Pleasant yeah. Boulevard. Well, they have people saying. Jerry Jackson Churchland. Or, yeah. yeah so sure. I think yeah. what happens, though, uh, what can happen, uh, that their intentions uh, might start out as an acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, it might evolve into, uh, you know, a, a nightclub with amplified music. So uh, I think with the use permit, uh, it gives you leverage to uh, make sure they uh, conform to what, uh, what the use permit was originally issued for. And that's an acoustic guitar or whatever. Let me read the definition. Yeah, what, what, what is the current it definition of an entertainment establishment. It says uses that offer some form of entertainment. For example, dancing, comedy performances, amplified music for patrons while on the premises. Entertainment establishments may serve alcohol, charge patrons a membership fee, and serve food for on site consumption. So that's a very broad definition. Mm -hmm. um, we, we raised the question about whether the issue was more about live entertainment in combination with alcohol consumption. Mm -hmm. Is that more of an issue than um, somebody playing a guitar at McDonald's? As a, use that as an example. We, that would call, fall under the same entertainment establishment uh, restriction, someone uh, doing something like that. Um, so it's a fairly broad definition. Um, and so I guess part of what we, you know, depending on how council would want to to do that, we could work on trying to refine the definition based on what you really want to have come before you. It's a DJ in that. It would be amplified music. So if you had a the DJ American in Legion on, off of Peach wanted to have a DJ, they would have to have a. Well, we wouldn't. If it was like a, you know, some of these facilities have been doing that kind of activity over the years are kind of grandfathered in. Mm -hmm. But if they were going to set up a DJ in there as a, as an activity, its potent, the potential would be there. And have it set up. Hmm? But a comedy club. Comedy club definitely it would be an entertainment establishment. But yeah. All right, Amy. Yeah. Amy <laughs> all of the, all of Amy. these uh, issues and going even back to the windows in the historic district, we can have all of the ordinance we want if we aren't going to follow up and make sure because they're enforced. If, if you know you go by the rules and you go down there and get approval for this particular type of window and go through the the steps to do that, and then the person next door doesn't bother and just puts them in. I mean, where does the enforcement aspect of it come? Same thing with the singing in the McDonald's or anything else, you know. Who's going to actually go in there and say, you have to have a use permit for that? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so we'll just throw that yeah, well, but, but, you mean, That's a good point, but um, that's an enforcement. Let's get the structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we need for the structure. Okay. The only question I was going to bring up, we're talking about the difference between amplified music and acoustic. Majority of places you go now, whether it's Barron's or anywhere else, you have one person that's acoustic, but they are amplifying the music. So very rare do you find anybody that doesn't have even minimal amplification with their microphone and the instrument they're playing. And that's pretty much anywhere you go now. If it's just one person on the guitar, it's still technically amplified. So I don't know if that's you know that's going to be a hard rule if we lean towards that definition because that almost covers everybody now. Ah. Um, and I'm just thinking, you know, looking at where we are today and and the generation that um, is enjoying going out to dinner or, or, or being engaged, people like to hear music. And we're not talking, we're just saying uh, guitar, things like that, holiday season. We have nice restaurants or venues that may not have this use permit that would love to have someone come in just are they playing holiday music? Well, right now that's prohibited because you can't do it if you don't have whatever that use permit is and go through the process. So I think as we look ahead, there are things that we've always had in place, but times have changed and people are wanting to go where they can hear some music and not any shouting, screaming, dancing, jumping through the windows, but just light music. 
that would have to come back before a whole process to be able to do that. Just looking forward. Go ahead, Bill. Well, you know, I asked about a comedy club, and I think that would be one element that, uh, you know, certainly wouldn't be disruptive, we don't uh, have a you know, to a surrounding community. That's not music. That's a, that's a performer. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, something like that, I don't think should be included. But I hear what you're saying about the the music. It's usually not the music that's the problem. It's the it's the after hours uh, right. a aspect. Right. Just like the coffee more shop. Alcohol related <laughs> yeah. Than music related. Right. Yeah. If let's just say the coffee shop. Coffee shop doesn't say beer or wine or anything. Mm. Just some coffee. If there was a guitarist that was just there playing some holiday music, they can't do it because they have to come back and get a use from it. So we have places that don't sell alcohol that would like to have. If McDonald's wanted to, the new McDonald's wanted to just have some holiday guitarists in there, they can't do it because they don't have that use permit. I, I think that, that what we're talking about is is the music incidental to the operation of the of the business or is it the main focus of the business? That's, that's a good thing. Get to down to, to mansion. The loud music was the focus of what they were doing. Yes. Greyhound, it was the same thing. That was the focus of what they were doing. Um, if you go to, to the coffee shop, you're there to drink coffee and socialize. The music is incidental. Right. So I, I think that's really the, the dividing line here you, that, that we need to look at. That's a good point. That's a I very would, good I point. I actually would do, do disagree. Paint that as a slippery slope. Um, and it's funny, I, I, I had to do some Googling right quick. I think I'm the youngest at the table right now. Um, uh, though I still yell, get off my lawn at kids all the time. Um, there's a culture of um, lounges, and a lot of them are, in fact, just coffee shops, which you, you go there for the combination. You go there for the live entertainment along with the baristas and everything like that. And it's something that... I, though, though we need to regulate, we need to welcome as well. That's right. Um, our, our the the old town is built for that, and that's mm -hmm. what we're missing on the Fridays and mm -hmm. Saturdays, right now. So it's it's critical that we we define entertainment establishments in a way that we go back to the first slide is welcoming to businesses, um, because that's really really critical. I, I think that the. The alcohol and the dancing are are very much differentiators from establishments that have music along with the atmosphere and performers along with with the atmosphere. Um, but we we, I mean it, it's it's a very complicated dance that we're doing here. So um, I I am more in favor of heavier regulation on this one, which would sound odd, um, but I think it has to be even across the board. Right. And I guess I feel like you don't need to bother with it. I, I think you can open up Pandora's box um, if you uh, just didn't have any kinds of requirements. You gotta have requirements. And the types of establishments, you know, and that's the key. What what is the type of establishment? What is the purpose? The definition. Of and then unless you have some uh, rules that they have to. And, and it shouldn't be difficult mm -hmm. to come and, and get permission to do it, depending on, you know, what it is and what what level, where, you know, they, they can't come in a little little building and a little restaurant and then, you know, throw up a dance floor and, and they only have like 10 tables in there and then they pack the house. So I, I just feel like there's, we, we need, my, my my vote would be to leave that alone, I guess. To, maybe if we can redefine it a little more. I think it but needs to be redefined. Now, it, it should be there. We just need to do some tweaking. And what are the best practices for other areas? That's what we have I, to find I would find love out. to see that. I mean, other similar sized communities uh, with the same offerings, uh, <coughs> um, something that's water, I don't want to use the term water side, but on the side of water um, and and uh, a, a historical district type type offering. 
we can do that. In addition, this these are this is a very rich and good, good conversation. Is there a way to stratify this, where you go through degrees mm -hmm. that as you become more intense, mm -hmm. for conditional use permit is required. It's not easy to get a conditional use permit, maybe not Absolutely. even time-wise. If you get the idea of, oh, gee, it's November, I want to have entertainment in December. You're not going to get it. You're not going to get it. Yeah. Well, we'll work, we'll work you, on that. We can work I think on that. best practice is mm -hmm. a great idea. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do share your concern, Ray, but I think that you know, if we can find a way to be like King Solomon and divide the baby, that might be worth looking at. When we can go back <clears throat> for historical reference, cities to require use permit for all restaurants, all restaurants, um, to get at this exact issue from years ago. We just throw everybody in. It's Gee. been refined over time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Obviously, it's been colored by time and changing interest in what the um, uh, downtown is intended to be, for example live entertainment, children's entertainment. It's kind of flowed back and forth as councils have sort of um, looked at what they're trying to create as an environment for downtown. For a while when it was more children's museum, sports hall of fame, you know, that kind of activity, there was a real concern about it getting too much live entertainment that would might be incompatible, adult oriented might call it entertainment. And that's always been that balance that's, that's come up in trying to refine this definition. Um. Elizabeth. Yeah, I know your name. Yeah, yeah, okay, just checking. Um, <laughs> I think part of the the stratification, to use your term, and like and, and, and where Kajie is going is some of it has to do with alcohol. You know, you take a little building like Cafe Europa versus a little building like the coffee shop. There's a difference in what they might choose to do because uh, because of alcohol. Mm -hmm. It's not about the food; it's about the alcohol. the alcohol, and that may be a a separator from between the men and the boys. Um, hey. It's one thing talking about, you know, and I, I agree with Ray that we still need to be on top of and looking at it. But as Dr. Patton and the mayor said about somebody that wanted holidays music, is there some way that we could do something and a offer nice. a temporary permit for something? limited like if they wanted christmas music for one month yeah. couldn't we you know maybe off. we could do something like that because we're not preventing them from having it because that's an established business that's already open that wants something temporary for a special reason that we can grant that and then if they want to do it permanent they could go through the process that's certainly doable if you would like something like that we could consider that and get back with you the, 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 the only festival. downside is uh, what what's the definition of the music that they're looking for uh, i mean if Maybe during the holiday, uh, you know, your definition of Christmas music and mine could be two different things. <laughs> well, I wouldn't base it on I wouldn't base it on the music, but they would still have to come before us for the temporary. They had to explain what it is, what they want to do, and then we could evaluate what they tell us and go forward from there. Yeah, it shouldn't matter what kind of music. Yeah, I don't. It's just yeah. music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't legislate on the content. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but my thing is, you you you're, you're going to give an entertainment permit. Uh, for music, no frequency for for, for entertainment, music, uh, well, uh, not not necessarily. Well, that's what so, the ordinance says. If so, the so if they got it for thirty days, if I'm a business owner, okay, why why can't I have it for the other? You can uh, if he comes months? back for the you use permit. Well, you, yeah. You've got a note taker that's. Yeah, yeah, we've got yeah. we've we've Multiple had to run out of the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, have, note -taker. we have a note taker. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we have a we put a lot on the table. Yes. Can you synthesize this? Can you mm -hmm. put it together and and its options? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's very clear. Okay. But the answer may not be right off the top of my head, but the direction <laughs> sure. is clear. Yeah. I mean, you got to process what Work we've said mm -hmm. right. and make sense of it. Then. Be so, so we talked about <laughs> it's got to be yeah. 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 I, I think it's a lot of first, pieces here. There's a consensus, not to put words in your mouth, there's a consensus, I think, not to do away with the conditional use permit entirely for entertainment establishments. That's right. Correct. All right. Having said that, there's Nate's idea of is there's some temporary process mm -hmm. that 
mm -hmm. uh, comes to council quicker, mm -hmm. um, and maybe even through the planning commission. But when you add two meetings, it's not that quick. Right. Um, and then all the other things that we said in here. How can we be nimble? Mm -hmm. I like that term. Mm -hmm. How can we be nimble to respond to Request. what's changing around us? That's right. It's At the same time, it's changing. You still want citizen input. I mean, this comes back to the doggone cell phone towers. We all know that that's a lightning rod, and the citizen input has had a, a great influence on how y'all have ruled on that. The same thing with with uh, um, the large entertainment facilities. Uh, the citizen input uh, weighs heavily on on us, and I'm I'm, I'm sure it does you too. Uh, probably more on us than on you. Got to go through us first in a lot of cases, and pass the buck to you. <laughs> just advisory. The only other thing when we're talking about the temporary permit for music, we probably ought to put something in there. They can only do that once within a certain amount of time, so you don't have the same establishment coming every month trying to get a temporary permit to beat the system. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got that point. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we're, right. not, we're not bypassing the yeah. right requirement right. entirely. Okay. Any more discussion on this one? No. All right. Let's go to multifamily. I think that's the last one, right? Yes. You want to break the ice? Be glad to. As I mentioned, the other but prior to. Um, 2010, the city required what was called a group housing permit, was the um, use permit for multifamily housing. Um, city council back in 2015 uh, raised concerns about um, about that and requested that the zoning ordinance be amended, which it was. That's been in effect uh, since 2015. I think since that time, you've probably had five or six applications that have passed through for use permits um, and, and one lawsuit um, as well. So. Um, I think that's sort of the issues you have before you. That's the um, the combination of uh, being, you know, trying to accommodate and promote development, trying to protect and be respective of the land use surrounding where the development is going, um, and whatever level of of, um, of um, regulatory oversight you want to have on some projects. And I do know from your comments um, on other issues tonight, there's a level of intensity. That you're, you're getting into. So, for example, we're all the way down to four units, you know, needing a use permit, as opposed to maybe some of the larger projects you might see that might have, you know, 100, 200 type type units. So there's some level of that as well. But um, generally speaking, what most people would end up doing, if you're going to go with more of a um, of a buy right standard, was to go back and be a little bit more heavy on the um, regulatory standard. Something that you said, I think we need to be reminded of, maybe <clears throat> six months, certainly within this year as we've discussed this that typically the requirement of a use permit for anything implies that you've got a concern about the use itself correct and and so maybe fundamentally it starts with whether or not that spot is zoned correctly is that the best spot for the family I could argue once you make that decision why have a conditional use permit Right. Now, one, one uh, option used by some other localities, they have created multifamily zoning districts. Well, that would be a rezoning for someone as opposed to a use permit. But again, you'd be using a zoning process as opposed to a use permit saying that location is zoned for multifamily. And then we'll let the developers, you know, do that. That's just one alternative. What we have, obviously, is multifamily as a use embedded w within other districts. Yeah. On a use permit, uh, I think most of us are aware the use goes with the property. That's correct. So a temporary use permit, that doesn't go with the property. That's correct. And, and so right. we, can, we can... And under normal circumstances, the use permit must be activated within two years. Obviously, in recent years, the General Assembly has been shifting that date down the road starting during the recession. But the, the typical standard in the, in the, in the code is a... Once you get a use permit, you're supposed to take action within two years or the use permit will become null and void. And that's state? That's allowed by the state and incorporated within our zoning code. Other comments? You may have just said this and it didn't sink in. Our multifamily zoning currently, if we, if we took this 
square this room and said it was multifamily. Is there anything in it that says that only means so many per acre or so many, or is it anything <coughs> more than four? Right. Well, the way our current, you know, the way the current code is structured, uh -huh. yes. I mean, depending on which district you're in, establishes density standards. And so, um, and I'll go back to the way it was before 2015. So you could be in a, whether it be downtown or or one of the higher uh, intensity residential districts, and it would okay. it would say, you know, multifamily uses up to, you know, 27 units to the acre, or up to. Now obviously, downtown we have a much higher density standard, um, but that's the way they would normally be structured. So it would establish. You know, a, a density, um, you can establish whatever you want. You can establish a parking standard. In our case, downtown, for example, we don't. You can establish open space mandates. You can establish um, orientation of the buildings, um, all those types of things. But the way they're structured is it does have a density component to the, to the use, depending on the district. And this applies to condo development? Yes. As I said, condo is a form of ownership, not a land use. That's multifamily. Other thoughts on this? Leave it alone. <laughs> yeah, I tend, that, to, I tend to agree with that. I do too. That's the light that rod, like the towers. Yes. <laughs> certain communities. Yeah, that right. I can tell you. Three hundred times over the years. Went three hundred, then they come back two eighty. Right. Then you know they change the numbers. Figuring, then they. I saw some heads nodding when Ray spoke. Do you all want to speak? <laughs> oh no, he said enough. <laughs> they should have been three. Yeah. They would have been good. Oh. I have to throw one other twist out here for you, because of the way our code is structured. You can vary that by district. Mm -hmm. I just throw that out as a as an alternative. You, for example, could say like no that. use permit downtown yeah. in the D1 district, for example, or the D2 <coughs> district, and then require it wherever else you want it. That's one thing about the way the current code is structured. You can vary that by district. It's not a across the board requirement. So I, I think it's been critical for the citizens to debate on these, and I think that's where Ray's coming from on this. And if I, I know you threw out the idea of the um, other type of zoning, the multifamily zoning, at what point would the citizen input come in with that? Be just like a use permit, just like on the rezoning application. We don't have anything zoned for it currently. You'd have to zone for it. The difference between rezoning is you're dealing with proffers, which are voluntary, whereas with a use permit, the city has the ability to impose conditions. Okay. So that's. That's a big distinction procedurally. Well, proffers only if it's conditional zone. That's correct. Yeah, the proffers correct. don't come automatically. Right. This didn't mean to ignore you guys. No, I'm I'm going hmm, over the downtown part. Mm -hmm. To me, if it's zoned properly, we shouldn't be having to go back and talk about it again. That's true. Is it safe to say that? Um, it depends on the district, whether or not a conditional use permit, and that's the way it is now. That if you right. were to do a multifamily, 23-story uh, building at the Holiday Inn site, a conditional use permit would not be required. Would be required now, but 20, you know, because we did a, a council's request across the board. Yeah. But if you'd gone back to 2014, it would have been permitted by right. By the way, for if you, this sounds like a digression, but it's not. Uh, I got an invitation to tour the Icon building in downtown Norfolk. It is probably the premier apartment building in Hampton Roads. I mean, it's very nicely done. It was done with historic tax credits, but, and the views of Portsmouth are fantastic. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, that would be a, a plus for our certain districts in Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. So did I state what I'm sensing correctly, that it depends on the district? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Guys. yeah. Well, nobody's going to want it in a community, but in, in where it is allowed in a downtown district. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not in the capital. <laughs> the <heart. laughs> that property out there well, is being developed at some point. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the City Council, members of the Planning Commission, I, I, I would also uh, suggest to you 
just as an overlay for this discussion. Certainly, the issues that you see here are issues that have developed over years. the last eight years. And so four to eight years from now, there'll be a different concept, they'll create a different issue. Secondarily, as it relates to some of these issues, it, I would submit to you it is unique to the property, not unique to the district. Because we have some districts where there's a residential section and some that are on main thoroughfares and what one would accommodate in a main thoroughfare versus an interior part of a neighborhood would be slightly different and we've got transitions. We are a fairly close to built out city and as we redevelop those things are going to change. Mm -hmm. However, the Mary Jane building is is uh, zoned currently. If that building comes down, then that offers some opportunity given the acreage and the unique nature of that property and where it's situated. Um, so, so uh, we, I want everyone to be prepared that as uh, staff uh, presents these larger overlays and districts, there are going to be some unique features within those that may require use permits as being the most efficient way to address a particular parcel versus an entire district or perhaps the citywide issues. Um, the only other thing I will say also as it relates to, um, and I'll give you the simplest cultural change. I can remember when I was in Suffolk and I came to Suffolk in 2011, the fights were about how many signs a fast food restaurant could have because our zoning in, in Suffolk had so many square feet of signage. Uh, and there was the battle as the more and more menus arrived on your drive through It used to be just one. You had one menu board, then they wanted two and three. three. Um, you're going to have some also potential um, unintended consequences because in Suffolk the issue was the debate between the Wendy's that gets seven or eight menu boards or signs and someone who's in a shopping center that wants to hang a vinyl sign or stick one of the flags out on the street and the rules don't necessarily coincide. Uh, so there are going to be some unintended consequences no matter what we do. Um, but you should be aware of that and be aware that uh, for a city like Portsmouth, uh, some of these issues are just going to be completely unique to the development or the redevelopment of parcels. Well, did you pick up enough from us? I did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this has really been a good no. conversation. I I mean, we are talking about the next eight years, the next 10 years, so it's, this is really important work. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, then if you want to go any more, <clears throat> just in, uh, we're not going to go through this page by page. I didn't know if you had taken the time to look or if you, you know, wanted to save this for future conversation. <clears throat> what we provided you was really just kind of makes, makes the point of our conversation about um, how our use table is set up, how uses are stratified by district, and whether they need use permits or not. So, if you, for example, if you look at that first uh, page there, we're talking about household um, living. And you see different kinds of dwellings, and then you see the use ta table talking about where they're permitted by right, where they need a use permit. If you see a slash or a blank, it's not permitted at all. Okay. Um, we don't see a lot of these. One of the reasons we didn't you know, make a big point for, uh, bring well, before you tonight is none of these are very common. On occasion, we might get a daycare use permit or something of that, of that nature. But I think the, the, the ones you just went over are the bulk of the use permits that will come before city council. Um, if you had anything you wanted to make get a use permit, doesn't sound like that's your direction you want to be adding in. Obviously, you could do that. If there are things you want to take use permits away that are already required, uh, that type of thing. Obviously, the use table will be coming back. Staff has not come back with any staff recommendations. We're going to have a, some simplification ones from earlier conversations with council. For example, we have a, a, a number of different types of things defining sort of the same thing, a bunch of different definition of parks. Uh, there's a fair amount of restrictions on city council's ability to put public facilities in certain places the zoning won't allow for, for whatever reason. That's a very unusual um, element of this zoning ordinance. We've got some specialty eating establishments which cause the problem. The 
Yeah, yeah like what? Like the Krispy Kreme is a specialty eating esta eating establishment. So special. Uh, and it gives them it, under the current code, it gave them special authority for their drive-through window. Just unusual stuff. Um, doesn't make any sense to me either. Um, we'll so we'll special. we'll be making some staff <laughs> recommendations. Especially with the lights on. <laughs> well, cleaning up. Well, it's like we're talking about a Dunkin' so Donuts sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> when you move from donuts to having breakfast, are you still? A specialty eating and stuff, yeah. or do you just change your zoning by changing your menu, which is always a bad idea. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want to be doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you had any specific uh, items from the rest of the use table, or if you wanted to hold that for when we come back with our staff recommendation. Well, I think we need to rely on staff. You, you, you know all of these. You, John can probably he got it all in his head. <laughs> We need, we should depend on y'all to direct us. Yeah, because the nonsense table. and the things that ought to be corrected and changes. Because we, you know, yeah. you know, we, we can go through and even know the what? frequency of right. One thing. Right. Well, our intent would be to apply the philosophy we discussed tonight. We'll take that back. We'll look at the table. We'll make sure we're developer friendly. That we're streamlining. That we're simplifying. And we're trying to not have too many places where it would be very difficult for you to figure out, can I do that or not? We're blessed with having two um, public universities, Norfolk State and Old Dominion. Uh, Dr. Pat and I met with the president, uh, president of NSU last week, mm -hmm. and it's my secret desire to get a campus of M NSU here in Portsmouth. Um, We've got the Tri-Cities, so we do have Old Dominion here. Did we do that? Does it fit? I mean, I've, I'm now concerned that our ordinance, that, that's a public facility. Mm -hmm. What um, restrictions does it place? Well, there would be restrictions, but most likely, yes, to be allowed. But, for example, a number of different public safety buildings aren't allowed. Fire stations aren't allowed in certain places. To me, they're just certain things. When I apply, what I think is common sense, Council should have the ability to put what you want, public facility-wise, where you choose to, to place it. If you think you need a fire station, the zoning ordinance should not tell you you can't have one there. Or a public so safety. that is one of the things we have on our list. We're just going to clean out all of those places where there's unnecessary restriction on the ability of city council to decide where it should be putting public facilities. That's a what do you got the problem with that? No. And so we, we have you know five or six different definitions of parks we want to clean up so yes okay with that yes yes we have dog parks um it's not a specific parks. not a specific we're land use get them as soon as we're going yeah. to if not required we would just have parks and that'd be if, right. if you want to turn a public park if you want to be a, a dog park make it a dog park we're going to simplify this in a in that kind of way, that you know, you don't need to have say a adult park, child park, dog park. Yeah, yeah skateboard yeah, park. It. We're not going to have yeah. all of those. Just going to be a park, and then you'd have, you know, however you want to use the park. That's the city council's business, really. The use permit, the not the use, the use table is more <coughs> for um, zoning administration for you, you all to users. use, yeah. right? Because Somebody comes in today, when I looked at, tw you have in this document twenty-one use table. Well, first of all, when you look at it you're lost with it's just so much there and so as mr um councilman smith just said they, they you know as as i look to mr baldwin and his team they're the experts to help god but i said to him we are not going through 21 use tables tonight because it, it we would be overwhelmed so it's more for their use they know what's on there and they advise that's what I was afraid of. That's why I said what I said. Right. <laughs> no, we're not going through them. No. You guys didn't come to work. Yeah. <laughs> we put that out there. So if there's something in particular you wanted to look at, yeah, uh, you, we could find it for people to see what it is uh, you had in mind. Our intention is when the staff will go back and we'll work with the planning commission, we'll revise. Lots of we'll be coming back and say, here's a proposed uh, revised use table. Mentioned a couple things. Just looking at this one will be different. The future one. Um, that, that those activity districts you see up there, those will all be gone. Those were referenced from the old mm -hmm. 2005 conference and plan. Mm -hmm. The districts were never established, so you don't need those. The uh, D2 district obviously will not be there uh, the way it was before. It will go back to more standard zoning, so there won't be a specific call out for the D2 district. Uh, the D1 district will be working on 
will likely want to propose some name changes and get away from the transect terminology, the T1, T3, 4, 5, and 6. So you'll see that shrink down a bit. And I do think based on uh, if I just want my one piece of hearing your comments, I think there's still some interest in, in pursuing some of this um, um, alternatives to making somebody get a use permit for, say, a special exception, mm -hmm. especially dealing with design issues. And we can certainly um, work on that type of thing where, where you're going to want design standards. What I always tell people is remember one name of the zoning ordinance. It is, it is, this is the law. This is not policy. It's not a plan. If it says your setback's 15 feet, it doesn't mean 14 and a half or it's 15. And, and there's almost no uh, administrative authority granted by the General Assembly for staff to move that stuff around. So you want to be very careful about it. And then if you want to have somebody have the ability to make some slight modifications, you have two options. You can do a special exception, which is you know, more like a design type of a thing. Or it could be a variance if they got an odd shaped lot or some unusual set of circumstances and go that route. I have one, one more tiny comment, um, and this goes a lot to what you were saying. In order to make it all user friendly and generationally friendly, is there any discussion of having this like the comprehensive plan where it's links well, in here? A instead? couple things we're going to do, and <laughs> uh, this is really more for where's, where's uh, Deborah White back? You're really Municode friendly. <laughs> <laughs> the Municode. Yeah. She's got the so we can stop that. paying as much money as we're paying to maintain. You're going to see a lot of the, what you're going to see is two things will come out of the end product when we get there. A lot of the graphics that are in your current zoning ordinance are going to go away. Right. You'll have a design manual that will be established to explain what those things are. One of the problems we have, as you can imagine, you modify a definition that has a drawing with it. <laughs> How do you modify the drawing to now match? Mm -hmm. And that's also much more expensive for Municode to just host it for the, for the city. So you know, what we're going to do is turn this into a much more simple, like a Word document, basically. And then you'll have a, a, ma a manual, which will have more of the descriptive um, graphics that would, that would go along with that. Whether we get to the point where you can kind of work your way around like the conference plan, that's we'll, awesome. we'll look at that. But <laughs> that's a little bit more than what we're doing at the moment. This is not related to the zoning ordinance per se, but um, it's our relationship between the city council and the planning commission. Uh, localities in Virginia have used this and Portsmouth has in the past where something's on a short fuse, whether it's rezoning or conditional use permit. The law prescribes the calendar, and if it goes to the Planning Commission and then the Council, it may be outside the calendar of the applicant, and we may miss an opportunity. What is Planning Commission's, what are your, your individual and collective thoughts about joint public hearings between the Planning Commission and the Council on that rare occasion where the calendar really is important and mm -hmm. we can shorten it by having our meetings together. My opinion it's, is that's a great idea because that to me is the essence of being developer friendly. I mean, we're going to have a special meeting to bypass, you know, our own mechanisms to that delay in their mind. I mean, you still have your meeting, you yeah. act on it, and then as soon as you act on it, we receive your recommendation and then we consider it. And it's a it's a process that's short. I, I support that personally because I think it's effective. It's effective when I've seen it work. Mm -hmm. There are those who feel, though, it's a slap at the Planning Commission because it says, how cool is it to have the city council watching what you do? I, I don't see it that way, and I wanted to make sure I, we air what your feelings are. I think it's a great idea. I, I don't. So, I don't so think move. that we have an issue with it. I think that what you might run into is a problem with the with the public. Public comment. Because yeah, the public yeah. here's yeah. here's our discussion. Then they've got two weeks to to think about what what their response is, and and then they come to you. So I understand what you're trying to do, and I don't think that anybody on planning cares if you sit there, mm -hmm. you know, right beside us. That's not a big deal. Council members, if I may, that's not really an issue. We've done that before. Um, on a city council meeting night, we've had the planning commission to meet to <coughs> deal with their issue. They adjourn, and then council during their regular meeting 
it's all happening on the same night. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing is, like you were saying, public notification. You would have to have two public hearings. Um, the biggest thing is the public notification. And Regina and my office, we work very well together, and we could post the notification. So that could be covered. We could take care of that. Don't let that be a hindrance for you. Yeah. And I just want to make sure that there wasn't any. We were not hurting no. your. No. You get to watch this on TV anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be often that. that oh, like no. That it would be yeah. that rare. Just, you know, let's say we had Amazon. But I think they it said sends a good message to that you're willing to see that, that we're really working together. together. Mm -hmm. You have Amazon, you can call me 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, That's all we had for, it for tonight. Um, uh, Thank you. And Go ahead. One uh, point, um, um, Mr. Bowenot's talking today. All of this, our goal is to have everything done and completed by the end of 2019. So we're we're here. We're going to be working with you, work through the year, and have it completed within the year. Amy, what what issues other than this would you all like to are mm -hmm. not issues but matters? Anything you want to just discuss? Yes, do you, um, do you guys have any applicants? We're starting to get a little light on mm -hmm. members. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, oh. We, we know that. We, <laughs> you have one that's resigned, and you know, we'll, we'll work hard to fill that. That's a good question. Thank you for asking. <laughs> I'd like to be this time, so. <laughs> We're yeah, good. but pick somebody good. <laughs> I can think of a couple of folks I'd rather not have on the commission. <laughs> Wait, what's okay. on me? Commissioner. All the questions that I really good. I thought it was good. Thanks, and, Mr. Ball. Um, if we can adjourn this part of the meeting, and so if you want to adjourn your meeting, that, that would be good. Okay, no further comment or discussion? No. I adjourn the planning commission. Special City Good. And we'll take a five minute break to allow the transition. Walk to the stay, but we have more. Just going to say, um, so, so Council is Young adjourned for five minutes. Mr. I'll, I'll find out. <laughs> and we need our clerk. Okay. Yeah. I can get another bite of cookie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you found the box with cookie in it? I did. I took some by cookie. It is approved. Yeah. And I told him the way. Powdered vodka. Yeah. yeah, I told I told him the other day I, was going, I wanted to get them for false advertising because in big print it says five calories, but in fine print it says per two fifths of a packet. Two fifths. <laughs> yeah, a little, a little word down there. He's magnifying glass to read it. Well, who's going to have two fifths of a packet? I know. <laughs> That's what I said. That's false advertising. <laughs> Wow. We're going to wait for Deborah. Yeah, yeah. Is that a fifth? Yeah, it's about a fifth. Two fifths. Not two fifths. Gonna wait. You gotta walk, that way you walk balanced. <laughs> you get a hook on each finger. <laughs> so only 40% into your uh, thing. That's ridiculous. It is. I figured that's... Just 12 and a half calories. They don't know. Put them on there. Yeah, right. So they got me. But I like how they print, so it's real big. Five. Yeah. Two fifths. Was Mel? Oh, Miss White. Where did Miss White go? I don't think so. I don't know where she went. I was trying to. Yes, she did. She's coming. I was trying to find. She's looking for me. And I was trying to find Miss Councilwoman Lucasburg. Oh, she's not here. Yeah, she's not here. She came out, but she went to the office. Yeah, she did. Somebody. I will. She's right there. There she is. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't know we were waiting on her.
It's like, I gave you the next thing you need. <laughs> now we can start. <laughs> okay. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of City Council, we will continue this evening with two presentations. The first presentation, Mr. Robert Moore, Economic Development Director, will provide an update on the city's year-to-date economic development investment through the Departmental Collaboration of Information Technology and Economic Development and the CIMAS Incorporated. This evening's presentation will unveil the Portsmouth sale, a mobile application available for both iOS and Android platforms. Mr. Daniel Jones will assist <coughs> Mr. Moore with his presentation. Mr. No, excuse me, I have one more to read. <laughs> the final presentation this evening, the Finance Department and, and Cherry Beckett, LLC, the city's auditors, are working together to deliver the FY 2018 CAFRA and audit. Mrs. Shell Spivey, Chief Financial Officer, will brief City Council on two key components of this year's audit process. Mrs. Krista Edoff, a partner with CBH, is scheduled to present the audit status to City Council tomorrow night with a resolution for adoption of the audit coming before City Council on December 11. Mr. Moore. All right. Thank you, Dr. Patton. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of City Council. Tonight, I will provide a brief update on the economic activity in our city. Uh, we are very excited to, to share this information with you all, but I want to uh, say two things, or a couple things, before we get started. Um, one, this information is year to date. Um, this is not information that we normally share this early. We wait till the end of the year, gather the information, and then put it out in a in the form of an, an economic update or an annual report. Um, and that normally is, is put out in in association with the state of the city. Okay, and year to date defined as calendar or fiscal? Calendar, we go calendar. So this is from January 1 until November 20th. Uh, 2018. Um, but that being said, um, again, because we do this calendar year, we normally release this information uh, to the public, if you will, uh, at State of the City. Uh, this is something that the we have prepared so that the mayor will be able to share um, the details of this information at State of the City. So I don't want to steal this thunder tonight, so I'm not going to. Uh, we will give some um, brief information and enough to get everyone excited, but the mayor will hit the home run out the park. So with that said, let's talk business, like you see on the screen there. In economic development, our focus has been over the last, let's say, you know, 12, 14 months now that I've been uh, director, the focus has been in four key areas. We have created a strategic plan. That strategic plan is focused on four areas, including business retention uh, and recruitment, a business-friendly environment, uh, creating the right infrastructure and making sure that we have talent recruitment. Now, I'm going to back up again and say that economic development is a team sport. And we chose these four uh, strategic areas because we, we will not do these by ourselves. Certainly, number one is our job in economic development, business retention and recruitment. Creating that business-friendly environment, we do that in collaboration with um, the planning department, the zoning department, and, and, and um, building permits. Infrastructure, we certainly do that with uh, Mr. Wright and his team over at in. Um, engineering and then the talent recruitment we do that with our workforce partners like the Hampton Roads Workforce Council or what was formerly Opportunity Inc as well as ODU and TCC and the like um, so I do want to say thank you to our partners because without them um, a lot of this would not happen and I also want to thank council uh, because you all have focused on and put a focus on economic development and that vision um, of having uh, a new city ordinance and a new uh, zoning ordinance and a new uh, comprehensive plan we've been able to have some some see the fruits of our labor if you will when we talk about pursuing new businesses, you see the six targeted industries up there. All of those make sense. Maritime logistics, small business, modeling simulation, retail, information services. Those six target industries, um, to date, we have worked on 52 projects as a staff. Um, that is, there are, those are a lot of projects. Um, and uh, that's a, a large number as compared to where we have been in the last several years. 
Uh, we have also had seven scheduled trips with our partners at HREDA, the Hampton Roads Economic Development Alliance, and with VEDP, the Virginia Economic Development Partnership. So basically our regional group and the state. Yes, sir. Uh, two things, because we are televising this, it might be good for the public to know what advanced manufacturing is. So advanced manufacturing, uh, we all, the best way to say it is your companies, there are companies out there that make these specialized widgets, whether it's for a company like a steel who does uh, some type of chainsaw, all the way down to our very own links. They have a certain technology that they utilize when they uh, create the duct work that they utilize. Um, and that's a specialized um, use. They have their own technology and their own way of doing things. Um, that's what we kind of consider that advanced manufacturing. Those jobs are uh, what we consider are those higher paying jobs. The average salary on those jobs are right around $55,000, $60,000 a year. Um, and that's why we focus on those. We have the industrial space and the industrial um, areas and buildings to house those type of users. Um, and it makes sense with the shipyard being right next door in our backyard, literally the port being in our backyard. Um, and companies like uh, Port Rail Crane that puts together the cranes and so forth. So that makes sense for us. And the other two, the Hampton Roads Economic Development Alliance, uh, can you brief counsel on its current transition that it's going through? Yes, sir. So the Hampton Roads Economic Development Alliance is the regional group that's, that currently represents uh, about 11 localities. Uh, and, and that's the majority of the South Side and then Hampton, uh, Newport News, Pocosin, and I'm missing someone in there, I'm sure. Um, but they are going through a, a, a transition right now. The um, the CEO, Mr. Rick Weddle, is is um, currently set to retire um, December 31st. Uh, so on January 1, they will have they will be in transition with a new some new leadership. We are still working through that process um, as far as who that will be. Um, and, and we are working closely with as economic development directors and with um, our liaison such as the mayor on the board of directors we are working to uh, determine who that will be in an interim basis uh, going forward. I'm for council's uh, information I'm serving on the um, uh, selection committee um, and most likely we'll end up with an interim candidate that will give us an interim director, and that will give us time to find a more permanent uh, director. Because this is a public-private partnership, yes. we need to find somebody that can cross both. Both lines, yes, sir. As far as the state, the Virginia Economic Development Partnership, uh, partnership. Um, the one comment I would make is that it's woefully underfunded. Yes. You want to elaborate? I, I will. Um, it, it is an underfunded um, uh, part of our um, state economy. Uh, the state economic development group does not currently have, in, in my opinion, I believe the mayor shares the same opinion, they do not have enough funding to really truly market uh, the state as they should um, in other areas. Uh, we did land, certainly, uh, the uh, half of a headquarters uh, with Amazon. Um, but however, that did um, that was at a cost. Um, that was a lot of the marketing budget was utilized to make that happen. Uh, so um, while they are underfunded, they are uh, working diligently. Stephen Murray has been a great uh, president and CEO uh, over the last year or so. Um, and we are working closely with him as well. Um, or again, as you can see there on our seven trips, um, within our seven trips that were taken as a staff. Um, so we're staying, staying close to the state and, and everything that they do affects us and vice versa. And this is really important. Think of yourselves as being the consultant con that uh, your client is looking for a place to, to do a new facility. And you're doing your work in Utah. You're doing it at the computer. And if Virginia is eliminated, we're eliminated. <laughs> right. If half the roads is eliminated, yeah. we're eliminated. Right. right. It's tough to get back in the game when they eliminate the whole state, or it's tough to get back in the game when they eliminate the, the region. Yes. So the, the important thing is to stay in the game as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take good leadership at, at the Hampton Roads regional level, and it's going to take a more robust um, budget yes, at sir. the state level. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I didn't mean to 
That's all right. Steal your thunder. No, no, no. I'm gonna steal yours in a little bit, so that's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, we also have mo multiple marketing missions that we're taking on our own. Um, um, one thing that I see consistently is, um, if there are any football fans in, in the house here, you will see uh, commercials and advertisements for other localities in our locality. Uh, you will see, uh, more specifically, a New York, a Charlotte, South Carolina, Atlanta. They have commercials in our neck of the woods. So um, we now have a commercial in their neck of the woods, mm -hmm. those same regions. I'm going to play it for you now. I'm hoping that it will play. A dependable workforce, a vibrant infrastructure, and most of all, ready access for employers, families, businesses, retailers, developers, restaurants, and lovers of art, culture, and entertainment. At the center of it all, Access Portsmouth today. Thank you. And that was, a, again, another collaboration between our uh, marketing department, um, our, our uh, retained marketing group, and economic <coughs> development. We're excited about that. And we've heard rave reviews. People have called and said, I like the commercial. I forgot the commercial was showing here because I'm so worried about it showing in Charlotte and all these other places. Um, but we are very excited about that. When it comes to retaining businesses, our business visitation program, or biz visits as we call them, um, I have to give a, a kudos to my staff. Um, I, you always hear me say I have the best staff um, in, in the city. Uh, but our staff has put together, since July 1, we have conducted 83 biz visits. So we've met with 83 existing businesses between the three of us in, in our office. Um, that's a lot of work on the ground, it's a lot of work in and out of the office. Um, you will also hear me say that we are not doing our job if we are in the office. Uh, we should be out meeting with businesses. Um, and the fruits of that labor, we've had five different expansion projects that have come because of us going out and meeting with those groups. Um, can't tell you all about those right now. They are in some of our numbers. Um, but we have um, three of our top taxpayers will be expanding this year. And as soon as we can make that announcement, we will. Um, but it comes from us sitting down and meeting and talking with them about their plans and really understanding what they can and, and want to do. When it comes to advancing our workforce, Higher Portsmouth, we have, we have kind of put the group together. Um, and we are working uh, towards having our initial kickoff meeting uh, early next year uh, to really talk about the workforce. If you read the paper today, uh, you will see that uh, ship repair and ship building, uh, we know how important that is to our economy. Um, they are looking to build, um, they have 287 um, carriers that they have right now, or ships, ships, ships now, um, they're trying to go to 355. If you do one carrier at a time, it'll take you, I think it was 2050 or 2052 to get that to happen. Um, there's a shortage of ship repair and ship builders. Um, so we need to make sure we have that workforce here. And it's great because we have that availability right now. TCC on December the 10th will open their Building Trades Academy right here in Portsmouth at 3303 Airline Boulevard. And that Building Trades Academy will have the welding, that maritime um, designation. So we're excited about that. And um, former governor and now Senator Tim Kaine will be um, attending that event as well. Um, so we are very excited about that. Um, but this is an opportunity for us to um, reach back into our public school system, to reach into our, uh, our vocational system and, and bring out some of those folks that can make a very good living uh, doing some of those things. Got to get the schools involved. And finally, we have to make sure we assess our, our effectiveness. And our effectiveness is based off of what we call smart metrics. Specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. Um, those are all we need to make sure we're, we're assessing what we're doing and making sure that we're being effective at what we're doing as a staff. And how we're going to measure those, we're going to look at jobs created, wages paid, investments attracted, rev revenues earned. Okay. So you take all of those four things and you roll them all together and there's some metrics that we have. Um, we look at the investment from a standpoint of land transactions. And let me just kind of break that down a little bit. We look at um, land sales, 
land that is staying on the tax roll but may have changed hands, land that was no that was previously not on the tax roll, i.e. the EDA or the city held it, and that is now back on the tax roll. Um, we're also looking at lease holdings, um, people signing new leases to be in the city. We look at those as well. Then we're looking at investment from a standpoint of taking that property and making some type of improvement, whether they add a building, whether they um, add some equipment, things of that nature to their business. Then we also look at jobs created and jobs retained. So I am happy to report this year um, we have done just that. And again, I, I, I thank my staff, I thank um, our colleagues in the other departments and certainly council uh, for what I am about to show you because this is all trickle down effect of what you all have done. I can tell you that um, in 2016, we started off with $8 million. 2017, we did $44 million. I'm happy to report that in 2018, we have $104 million in investment in our city. Um, that is a considerable increase. Um, but let me break down that number a little bit so you kind of understand where we are. Again, when I just talked about the land sales and the lease transactions, those are kind of that shot in the arm, one time you're going to feel the effect. Okay, um, That's probably, again, it's already been on a tax roll, it's already been, you're already receiving taxes in some way, shape, or form. You may receive some new taxes in there. Um, where we are, is that we're at about a little over 45, 46 million dollars. Um, but the rest of that money, uh, that say 60, almost 60 million dollars, that's all new tax base. So if I go and I just use basic math and use dollar thirty for every one hundred dollars okay that gives us a tax generation again based off 104 million dollars of about seven hundred and thirty thousand dollars that's a great number for us i think um especially where we've been over the last few years we've affected 1123 jobs we have created 300 jobs at, a, at an average salary of about $48,000, and we've retained, based off of those um, five, or actually we're at about, <coughs> about seven or eight different um, ex retention projects, expansion projects, we've saved 823 jobs, okay? That's a sizable investment into our city. That investment has caused the need for staff to make some investment in itself. So what we have done, is from a technology standpoint, we've added CoStar, which is the premier um, property um, management and, and database um, in the world. We are now licensed users of that. We were not previously before. We also have Salesforce, uh, which is what we call a CRM, or a Customer Relationship Management System. Um, we utilize that now to track those 52 projects. So if, if Dr. Patton comes to me and says, Mr. Moore, I need to know and understand what's the investment been so far? How many jobs have been created? What's the square footage total that we've, that we've affected or, or had an impact on this year? We can pull that and track that via um, Salesforce. And finally, because we've done all that, we also need to make sure, as you talked about previously, we need to make sure we stay in the game. We need to make sure we have the ability to stay in front of individuals because most of the time, they know about us before we know that they know about us. Um, and that's because they're looking at our, our, our digital footprint. They're coming to our website. Um, but now, they can come to an app. Um, you may recall uh, back in February, April, when we had the, the retreat and then some follow-up meetings, we talked about the properties that the city currently holds, the EDA currently holds, PRHA, and how we will dispose of those. How do we market those? Well, now we have a new app. Um, it is a collaboration between our IT department, economic development, and Simis Incorporated, uh, headquartered right here in Portsmouth. We have, now have the Portsmouth Sale app. SAIL stands for Site Availability and Information Locator. Now, I'm just the salesman in this thing. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to the technology expert, but Mr. Daniel Jones is going to walk you through, uh, after Dr. Patton, uh, uh, <laughs> this app. Mr. Uh, Mayor and Vice Mayor, members of council, this idea was generated by the two gentlemen who are standing before you. And through their vision, they went to uh, the Simmons, Dr. Garcia, with their idea. And what you're going to see tonight is something that everybody's going to want <laughs> in the country. What a clever name. Yeah. 
Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of City Council. It's our pleasure to bring before you the Portsmouth Cell app. Now this, as Dr. Patton has alluded to, this will be available both on the iOS and Android platform. So no matter what type of mobile device you're using, you'll be able to use it. That'll be done on an iPhone, iPad, it's agnostic, whatever you want to use it. So as you can see, there's two main tabs at the bottom, a welcome screen, which is where you're at now, and a property screen. The property screen we'll get to in just a second. Your welcome screen contains the three access pillars for economic development of lifestyle, workforce, and infrastructure. So if somebody clicks or goes to the lifestyle, it goes into each detail about what the lifestyle in Portsmouth is. Same way with workforce. The higher Portsmouth, as Mr. Moore alluded to, what is within the workforce that we currently have. And then of course the infrastructure, where we're located, the infrastructure, hospitals, airports, um, how to get product in and out basically <coughs> of our city. So the real jewel of the app is the property screen. So to get to and this can be, of course, downloaded from any device anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. So to get this business attraction in front of potential um, candidates that want to come to do business, they can pull this app up. So as you can see, there's a dot that's coming off that's showing where we are now, City Hall. Okay. So if you want to look at your first property we want to show, that's going to be 1021 High Street. So automatically, you can see that it's 2.957 acres, approximately 48,000 square foot. It's in the D2 form-based code section. So if you want to look at the street view, it pulls up the Google image mm -hmm. of the street. You're able to. I only had to get on the plane. Mm -hmm. No, you don't have to get on the plane. No. Look all the way around. Put me out of business. <laughs> <laughs> also, if you want to look at the real estate part of that property, this pulls directly from what our city assessor has that shows the assessments, anything regarding the sales date, uh, the deed book, everything, all the ins and outs regarding the property. And if by some chance you were um, interested in this property, you would click contact us. And what that does, this allows you to fill out your contact. And more importantly, when we receive it, it shows exactly what address that you were interested in. So there's no guessing game if you're contacting us. And, and very quickly, I think the other key thing to point out is, can we go to BASF very quickly? If you look at the top of the screen, some of the most important features that uh, developers want to see. How far are we from an interstate? Mm -hmm. 2.7 miles. How, are we, how far are we from the airport? How far are we from the port? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This all changes and adjusts based off where you are in the application. Mm -hmm. How do you track people using this and how do you capture once they hit submit? That, that would be the back-end metrics that we would receive. Downloads, how many people download it, how many times it's accessed, um, contact us forms that are sent back and so yeah. forth. Is it, um, does it get down to geographic uh, dispersion of the use? It should. Yeah. So in, one more quick thing and then we'll, I'll show you. If you look at one other property that is marketed by a agency. If you click the flyer, pulls up exactly what it is. Isn't that amazing? But yes, sir, to answer your question, we should be able to see, just like on a website, analytics, right. where they came from, uh, where they were searching, what they were searching for, right. so on and so forth. And maybe you don't know, maybe you want to look through all the properties. <coughs> You can do a filtered search. So if you say you want an acreage between four, well, I'm, I'm guessing here. 
4 and 10, yeah. it automatically shows you that there's five properties. So you want to see that? You click University Boulevard. And don't worry, and go down. it won't take you to any other city. No, no. no. Right. 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 Just, just Same way with edification. Who owns Loaded that? Uh, who owns that property? Do you know Robert? Yes, sir. That is the uh, that's John Peterson um, with the Peterson uh, Company, Terry Peterson Company. Um, that is the property that is directly behind Mass One. Yeah, um, it's about seven acres. Yes, about seven point three four acres there. Is that who's so Harvey Lindsay handling? The, the broker? No. no. Um, Harvey Lindsay represents, um, that brokerage firm represents the building of Mass One, um, but that is directly with the, with the owner. And then, of course, the additional filters, if you're looking for square footage, particular zoning, enterprise zone, hub zone, whatever that may be. And with that, that's the Portsmouth wow. sale app. Isn't that amazing? Very good. Yeah. Any questions? Is it live now? No. No. It will we, be. We, we wanted will you all to see it yeah. first. We needed to receive the, the wonderful artwork from Mr. Um, Pace, um, who created the logo for the sale app. So once we have that now and some other tweaks that we need to make, um, it will be posted. And as soon as it is posted, we will let you all know. And there's that time frame from when we execute it, Apple and Android have yes. to approve it, and it goes to their process before they make it live in the store. And is there a what's the cost range to get the app onto your device? It's free. It's free. It's free, but we are in some discussion. Okay. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Yeah. It's in the legal hands. Yes. How would we make it free? It's in discussion, some, yeah. Mayor, with There's some legal. opportunities there. It, it will be free to download. Right. Um, but there are some opportunities that could be associated with the Additional application. Opportunities. Additional opportunities. So how are we going to define success, though, when we got 10,000 years? <coughs> we're going to defi define, we define success as we sold these properties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how we're going to do But as far as, as this app is concerned. Yes. We will look at the, um, we look at the average of, of the users, you know, compared to, you know, what we have. Certainly when you first have the application available, Available, there's going to be a flood of people that download it but how does that how do we stabilize that where does it level off and again just the activity where are we seeing the activity coming from um, because we're going to utilize this to measure a number of different things but more specifically when you look at the commercial that we have if we're having it in certain regions are we seeing an uptick in those regions looking at our application so it's kind of a one hand washing other two questions okay First question, there's, there's 91 properties that we currently have that yes. we're managing. Um, and the second, the commercial that we had, um, is any of those funding dollars coming from HR, EDP, EDA, and um, no. Virginia um, EDP, are there any cost sharing in that or does it all come from us? That all comes from us. So we're only showcasing Portsmouth in those commercials. So we're out marketing literally just Portsmouth, not the region. We're talking about the, the access that we provide to the region, but that is all coming from us and about us. Do we still contribute on a per capita basis to uh, Hampton Roads? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Is, that, is that still, what is it, a dollar? It's 90, yeah, 95 cents per capita. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's, dollar. yeah, that's the problem because most of the budget is made up of public dollars yes. and they need more private partners in that. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's important to get a good headlight uh, in the next director. Yes. Hey, I'm the, sorry. Uh, no, I'm fine. The commercial, will the commercial be able to be linked on the app so somebody going into the app would be able to see that commercial? Yes. We, will, we, will, we can make any tweaks, correct me if I'm wrong, and also we will make it to where the application um, will essentially be available on the website as well. It's so a, a, a version of that will be on our website. So if for some reason you're just at your desktop and you say, I want to look up Portsmouth, you can do that. It'll be there. And, and let me go back to, and Bill, that's one of the reasons why I, I kind of threw my elbows to get on the selection committee, because mm -hmm. I think the public sector needs mm -hmm. to be represented. We've got the biggest <coughs> amount of contributions. Scan in the game. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Scan in the game. You've got to be at the table. Is that a nationwide search or is that? Yes, yeah. it is. Maybe there'll be somebody from Norfolk Southern that doesn't want to move. <laughs> Maybe. Mr. Mayor. Sure. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the City Council, 
Mayor, speaking to your question of how do you measure success, I think you can use the old television marketing uh, model. Whenever you get a hit from anywhere outside of your television area, certainly, you know, that uh, expansion, that interest outside of the areas we reach by other means is certainly some indication that you've got folks outside of our region, outside of our MSA, outside of our television region chiming in and have, showing some interest. So um, certainly th those are the kinds of things I think yeah. uh, we should be looking for. Well, you know, how do you, just like how do you get a high school student to tear off the application for a particular college? How do you get mm -hmm. someone who's in Arizona to download this app? Well, part of it is going to be from a marketing standpoint. Now that we have the app, we we're working on some. We have some. We have about four commercials that are done: two 15-second slots and then two 30-second slots. We can tweak those as necessary. Uh, also, we're going to make sure our um, lead behinds, whether it's our, our personal business cards or what have you, have a potentially a QR code or some type of way to just scan and the app downloads on your on your phone. Um, however, what I will say is um, when we look at the other opportunities that Dr. Patton was speaking of, and we look at um, <coughs> the opportunity to um, really take this to the next level and have it in front of the um, brokers, like a Harvey Lindsay, like a CBRE. Uh, those will be the individuals that will more than likely utilize this the most and provide us the most opportunity um, when it comes to um, how we utilize this further. Very good. Any other no, no, no. comments? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Miller. Thank you. Now, uh, members of council, we will bring Mrs. 5A for a brief update on our um, CAFR and audit. Ms. 5A. <clears throat> no, we're going to do EDA, I mean, PPEs, PPEA next. That's too little, too, too little words on the party. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of City Council. Um, Cherry Becker, are the independent auditors who are performing the city's annual audit, um, have been on site since early October um, performing um, an audit of the city's transactions and processes. Uh, the finance staff has prepared the um, fiscal 2018 comprehensive annual financial statements, which are commonly referred to as the CAFR. Uh, we did encounter two significant accounting challenges um, as we uh, were preparing the statements um, that I you know, want to brief you on tonight. Um, the first of those was um, capital project cleanup, and, um, and the second is GASB 75 OPEB. The, um, for ca capital projects, capital project accounting must be in compliance with generally accepted accounting principles. As a result of the CFO transition this year, both Ms. Ann Seward, um, who served as interim CFO um, prior to my arrival, and then when I came on board, we both realized that the capital project accounting was not in compliance with generally accepted accounting principles. Um, some of the things that are required um, by, uh, we refer to generally accepted accounting principles as GAAP, are that um, non-capital operating expenditures need to be expensed in the year incurred. That um, construction and process should be recorded as a non-depreciable asset until the construction is completed. Capital completed projects should be capitalized in the year completed and depreciation should begin that year. And, um, and one of my first initiatives as CFO was to embark on a capital project uh, cleanup. And that project um, has identified a material amount of expenditures which were not recognized in the correct year. The project cleanup will result in prior period adjustments. Um, 
in both the governmental and the enterprise funds that we've um, we've done um, our, a deep dive yeah you know, with the attempt that that we're um, fixing it all this year um, Cherry Beckert um, do you they have an understanding of the project that we embarked on and therefore their auditors are doing a much more in-depth review of how we're uh, handling our capital projects and that um, that was very that project was very labor intensive and um, and you know, so it you know, put us where we where we are today with our CAFR. The second is Gasby. Yeah, let's, let's make okay. sure okay. we okay. All right, uh, Lisa. How many projects were affected by the, the cleanup, years. and how is it going to affect us? Yes. Um, going forward, it's more than a hundred projects. Um, I don't, I, I don't have an exact count, but I can, I can, I can get that to you. And the effect of the cleanup is. Um, beginning fund balance will probably have a prior period adjustment of right now it looks like about 20 million dollars that will decrease prior year um, fund balance now go back in the enterprise funds it it actually goes to on to the fund statement so like public utilities will be most affected because it'll actually be on the fund statements um, so there's fund statements like general fund, public utilities, and that there's also an overall statement. You know, that's what we call the enterprise-wide statement. For the governmental funds, with um, general fund being the largest, um, the, uh, the result of that will not hit the fund balance in the general fund, but will hit the, um, the overall accounting. So when we look at the, the general fund specifically, you, um, a, a user of that of that fund statement would not notice this change, but overall they would notice that our change in net position um, is starting out at a lower level. And this does and does not affect our bond rating anywhere. It um, it it sh it. It should not because we, uh, we're coming in with uh, with clean financial statements. Um, so the um, the change you know will be disclosed in the statements, and um, you know, the Cherry Becker partner will be here tomorrow, and she'll um, you know, she'll talk to you about um, something they'll be reporting relating to that change. It's, it's much like having four cups and ten marbles. Yes. You're just rearranging where the marbles, what cups they go into. That sounds, um, yes. That's, yes. That's a good yes. analogy. Yes. The other thing. Uh, okay. no. okay. So, then, so that, that will be noted in the CAFR as a finding? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it's a correction. Yes. It's a finding. Um, and it's a, I've, I've have discussed with the partner, so it doesn't quite seem fair. <laughs> it's a finding this year, because we, we, that you found. Uh, we, we found, found it. We found it. We found it. That's it. <laughs> we found it. Yes. Will, and will, Mary, will that be will that be noted in the CAFR? It, it, um, she, uh, I have not we've, seen the write up, but she is. We've met with her. Yes, and we have discussed our concerns. that. Concerns. The yes. other thing. This goes back. How many years did you go back? It's um. Most of the decade, but it goes back years into the 90s. I mean, so it has been a complete cleanup. Uh, everything is in line and how it should be done. And um, when we met with Mrs. Edolph, she acknowledged that um, they didn't see it. I was saying that weird. They never that but um, we have had to. Uh, we had the interim, and then Mrs. Um, uh, Spivey who came and immediately within your first week okay. almost yes. she she sold any uh, what what's been changed to ensure that it wouldn't happen again well it's it's yes. she's going through following the practices okay. of, right. of the, finance yeah. right the, yeah. the control there should be controls in place that um, at, at least annually and you know maybe more likely quarterly there'd be a reconciliation of what projects are finished what projects aren't is there anything in our CIP that can't be capitalized? So we go ahead and expense it. 
and um, so it's just tighter controls. Which and time. when do you realize it as a uh, asset and then start depreciating? That's that's right. So you know, so you know, for example, a um, a project that takes uh, you know, multiple years, multi years to complete. You know, once it's complete, we need to. Um, recognize it's an asset and start depreciating it and not leaving it in um, construction and progress where it's sitting there not being depreciated. Okay. So where are we? Okay. So, right. th this isn't something that the uh, auditors could have picked up? We, th we don't understand. The answer is yes. I mean, they could have. Yes. But they, huh? I said they could have. But they did. They, they did this every year, don't they? But they, so, yes. What's their explanation on why they didn't? Oh, we didn't get an explanation. Um, but, but she she will be here tomorrow. Right. Uh, they do a sampling of it, and sometimes it's I, I, I think that's probably. I think sa sampling. They also you know, re you know, rely on the information. You know, somewhat rely on on the information that's given, given the to world. them. Well, what they do is a recapitulation, right? In other words, they. You know, if two and two, we say two and two is four, they just go behind us and, and agree with our figures. That is pretty much what was said. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a good explanation. Do their job, man. We pay a lot of money for that. Yes, we don't pay them that much. Okay. Yeah. And there's not that many firms that respond to the public accounts that's, like that's, ours. That's right. It's getting really narrow. That's, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. it's, it is. It's, it's a limited pool. It's, it's special. Um, firms now you know, either specialize that in governmental or not. Okay, we're good. Okay, ready for the next? Okay. Gatsby. Thank you. Okay, the next is GASB 75 um, OPEB. Um, GASB 75 is a new governmental accounting standard that was implemented um, for this year. It reflects an overhaul of the standards for accounting and financial reporting for post-employment benefits other than pensions, the largest one being uh, retiree health care. Um, GASB 75 requires disclosure of more information in the financial statements and the reporting requirements are more extensive than previous standards. Uh, the changes require, required additional information to be provided to our consultants who prepared um, the actuarial report, which shows the unfunded actual actuarial accrued liability calculations. Um, for example, age-specific claims cost must now be used for each individual on the city's health care plan. Um, Regard, you know, regardless of um, of their age, yeah, regardless of their age or the chances that they will actually um, use our you know, post-employment benefits, so our you retiree health care. But they age out at 65, right? They um, because yeah, they're they're no longer on our plan. That's, that's that's right, and that's included in the you know in the calculations of so it's of those when, that are younger than 65 but are retired. That's that is correct. Yes. Um, so so they take the way we manage our plan, our plan, and ca and, and make calculations. But this year, the um, the calculations were much more detailed and specific, and uh, and we were um, finance staff was challenged in in getting the information to you know, exactly the way it was needed. The good thing is we, we have the report, we received it last week, and, um, and because of changes we made um, in you know, funding the $3 million, putting it into an OPEB trust that has the ability to earn um, more money than if the city was holding it and investing it in, um, you know, in the types of investments that the city can invest in. The combination of that and having this more specific, detailed information for the calculations, our liability significantly declined. Are dependents uh, included in that, or only retirees? It's dependents are included. So, so we had to also identify yeah. any dependents who are receiving our health care. Could have a situation where the, there's an age differential where the retiree ages out, turns 65 or right, 66, but they're you dependents. Got, 
younger spouse. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so and Ms. Sure. Ms. Gooden would, would know more specifically how our plan works as far as that goes. Um, but, but, okay. What, what was the decrease? Uh, okay, the, the decrease is we went from um, more, uh, the, the unfunded liability um, for the previous year had been estimated at um, a, more than 70 million and we dropped to 30, um, close to 30 million. Wow. Um, so it's, it, um, it was, um, it was kind of a, it's the first year, a, you know, the, you know, the first year of having the money in the trust and, um, and then getting the more precise right. information to the actuary, um, was, you know, as that's well worth, is well worth it. That's a paradox because GASB on OPED usually costs you money. That that's exactly right. right. Saves you money. Right. So this this year this this time it worked it worked to our benefit. It, it took a lot to get it, yes. but we got it. <laughs> um, so as we said, Miss um, Edoff, the partner of Cherry Beckert, will be um, here tomorrow night um, presenting um, her audit update, and we expect the audited CAFR to be um, ready for adoption on December 11th. Questions? Thank you. Mayor, I have one more thing. I have one more thing. Oh, it's just unreal. I mean, I'm sorry. I have one more. I said good catch. Yeah, I said it's unreal. 30, 70 to 30. Oh, yeah, that difference with yeah. Dr. Um, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of City Council, um, as you are aware, the City of Portsmouth received an unsolicited proposal from Amata Hoffler for the construction of a new Portsmouth City Hall and public safety building on proper property either owned by the city or other entities in May of 2018. The city accepted the proposal and in accordance with the guidelines of the PPEA provided the opportunity for competing proposals from other interested parties. The city received one additional proposal which subsequently uh, was withdrawn by the party that submitted it. Tonight, Mr. Michael Ammons, purchasing officer, will provide the rationale for the city manager's request to city council for internal staff to begin to review and evaluate the accepted proposal. Um, with uh, Mr. Um, Ammons coming forward uh, on the agenda tomorrow night would be a proposal, would be um, a um, resolution in the city manager's report for your consideration. Mr. Ammons. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mayor, by Mayor, members of council, the PPA provides for you to for the city once a proposal is received to either evaluate in one of two ways. One, you can hire a set of professionals, the professional engineers, architects, and a certified public accountants evaluate the proposal. Or the second way is to council can can by resolution allow the city staff to perform the evaluation. There's multiple reasons for that. To, take, to keep it as impartial as possible, the recommendation this time is to allow the city staff to do the proposal evaluation that will also help eliminate potential conflicts of interest from any professional firm that we would use in this area to help evaluate. So, there any questions? Any questions? Yeah. So we say an inside? Inside. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. What you're saying is that if we selected an engineer, they may have a conflict. Oh, yes, sir. There's conflict. a possibility. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Anybody got any problems with that? No. How long would that typically take? Oh, uh, for the evaluation? Within the next two months. That's an estimated timeline. 60 days. Yes, yes, sir. About 60 days. All right. So we'll expect this resolution tomorrow. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. That concludes my presentation. Okay. We do have a need for a closed meeting. Is there a motion? Uh, move to go into closed meeting pursuant to Virginia Code subsection 2.2-3711A1 for the discussion of an assignment, appointment, or contract contracts of city council appointees, and B, pursuant to Virginia Code section 2.2-3711A7 for the purpose of consulting with legal counsel pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation and open meeting would adversely 
affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body, specifically regarding the commons at Portsmouth Center? And C, pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A6, for discussion or consideration of the investment of public funds where competition or bargaining is involved, we have made publicly made public initially the financial interest of the city would be adversely affected, specifically regarding the potential development of a new city hall. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Clark? Yes. Mrs. Lucas Burke? Yes. Mr. Moody? Yes. Ms. Summers? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mayor Rowe? Yes. We're in closed session. <laughs>